I want to thank you all for having me speak today at this symposium um, because I appreciate any opportunity to refresh the island memory about projects and times that were dear to my mother's heart and which seemed to me both very near to me and also yet 50 or more years ago, many of them. Um, after my mother's death in 2014, I wrote a memoir called Mary Ann Beinke's Nantucket Textile Renaissance about the time from 1961 to 1975 and longer when she founded the Nantucket Looms and the School of Needlery. As we uh, heard yesterday from Liz Winship, uh, a lot of details about that. Um, but I would like to, uh, you know, unravel a few of the um, questions about those. And um, anyway, I used articles, documents, and artifacts that my mother and I had both hoarded for many years. Uh, we're both extreme hoarders. Um, <laughs> supplemented by my memories of the time uh, as a young witness to all of these uh, developments and a participant in many of her projects. This memoir that I wrote is available through the NHA Research Library and it goes into a lot of more detail than I'm able to cover in this overview that I'm giving today. And uh, I encourage anyone to read it if they want more detail. And um, also, um, in addition to a printed out version, paper version, which is my preference as a bookbinder, um, to, uh, to the memoir, there's also a thumb drive that contains it, plus uh, an, uh, arc a file of photographs of all of the things pertaining to uh, the, uh, uh, what I donated to the NHA um, in the last few years. Um, um, so, uh, as I say, I encourage people to look into it, go further. You can download it with my permission, um, and, um, and it will really uh, clear up a lot of the history of what happened here back in the 1960s and later. Um, and this paper today concentrates on the needlery aspects of what I call my mother's textile renaissance. But you'll forgive me if I touch briefly on some of the other subjects that pertain to it. Um, so my mother, Marianne Beinecke, was a weaver, embroiderer, and textile historian. And she first came to Nantucket in 1960 because of her second marriage to my stepfather, Walter Beinecke, Jr. And ta-da. Um, so this is, this is Walter Beinecke, uh, my stepfather, otherwise known as Bud Beinecke. And he was uh, mostly a lifelong summer resident in the early 1960s. But um, he was involved in several activities of both a for-profit nature, such as the total rebuilding of the White Elephant Hotel, which uh, reopened in 1963, and a non-profit nature on the island. Uh -huh. This is a slide showing my mother and Walter at the opening uh, ceremony of the White Elephant Hotel. <clears throat> Um, the most important, uh, or several of the nonprofit things he did was, such as the founding of the Conservation Foundation, uh, work with the hospital, and especially for this subject, the Nantucket Historical Trust, which I think he founded with his father in 1957, before I knew him, so I'm not quite sure of the details. Um, his father, Walter Brannicke I, uh, was also very involved in Nantucket um, projects of a nonprofit type. Um, and the Nantucket Historical Trust, uh, which bought and restored examples of Nantucket architecture, and then they would sell them 
with covenants on them in order to fund the next project that they did. Um, and so th um, they spo also sponsored programs that enhanced Nantucket's history and culture. In 1961, the Nantucket Historical Trust began the restoration of what became the Jared Coffin House Inn. And at that time, the island had an imbalanced dependence on its brief summer visitor season <coughs> and languishing fishing industry. Um, in the early 1960s, the summer season basically was from July 4th until Labor Day. And Walter wanted to extend the shoulders of the season by creating a year-round hotel <coughs> and other um, off-season opportunities. Marianne wanted to help improve the economy of the island by developing <coughs> craft businesses of weaving, embroidery, and others. So she founded the Nantucket Looms and the Nantucket Needlewomen in order to create the textiles used in the Jared Coffin project. The trust also sponsored, uh, also restored the Marshall Gardner building on Lower Main Street that afterwards housed the looms and other trust projects. Okay, um, so you saw uh, the last picture is a picture of my mother uh, on top of one of the looms. And um, uh, she was, my mother was the director of Nantucket Looms, researching and designing woven fabrics, locating materials, and working with loom manufacturers to develop custom equipment um, so that they would have uh, looms, for instance, that could be um, provided with a, a um, I don't know all the <laughs> expressions for loom equipment, weaving equipment, but they would have a um, axle on which the warp would be woven that could uh, make use of many, much more yardage of, of the fixed uh, warp in order to be able to uh, use uh, it for many more lengths, of many, much more yardage of fabric as well as to um, be able to take off the prepared warp and put another one on that same loom and store the warp until it was needed for a, a, another uh, order of the fabric. That's just a for instance of one of the uh, developments that they uh, made during this project. Um, let's see. Uh, so Andy Oates, uh, which you heard about, whom you heard about yesterday, uh, a weaver who had studied at RISD as well as at Black Mountain, North Carolina, was the manager of the looms and he was in charge of training the weavers, designing fabrics as well, and supervise the production of all the fabric. Um, for the Fr Jared Coffin House project, for instance, they produced in, in just basically two years time, 6,000 yards of hand-woven fabrics, which is phenomenal, especially in, in 1963 when uh, most hand weaving was just for, you know, place mats or, uh, you know, small yardage of fabrics. So another aspect of the Trust Jared Coffin House project was the establishment, oh wait, yes, yeah, so this is just an example of the type of drapery and upholstery that was um, uh, produced for the Jared Coffin House. This particular picture is of the West Parlor of 69 Main Street, my parents' uh, house on the island for uh, winter residents. <clears throat> um, as, as I was saying, another aspect for the project was the establishment by my mother of a group of trained embroiderers, later called the Nantucket Needlewomen to produce various embroidered, tatted, and crocheted textiles for the restoration. In the early 1960s, while we lived off season in Rye, New York, Marianne took lessons in New York City from Erica Wilson. 
in advanced cruel embroidery. Ta-da! And you saw a picture of this in yesterday's uh, presentation. Uh, this, this is two pillows she produced at that time, which I think are brilliant in their skillful stitching. And I brought, I've brought one of these pillows with me here today um, that people can look at later on in the show and tell in the research library, if they wish. Um, so also the embroidery she made for what she called her guitar chair, since it has musical instruments carved into its backrest, but she also used it when she was practicing her classical guitar. Uh, I'm sorry that the sun is shining on part of this, but um, I, I'm very fond of, of this embroidery also. Um, is another beautiful example. So as she took lessons from Erica Wilson, my mother taught me the stitches also. And um, this cruel embroidery on an Erica Wilson design that I finished when I was 11 in 1962. And it's not as superlative as my mother's, of course, but I think nothing to be ashamed of. But you can see that um, a lot of the stitches that were used in her pillows that she did uh, were then taught to me and used in this uh, design from Erica Wilson. And I also have another piece of linen on which uh, a companion design was printed um, of a squirrel, um, which I never even started. And in fact, the squirrel design has faded a great deal with washing, so it must have been done with one of those special rub-a-dub pen pens <laughs> that <laughs> Elizabeth just told us about. Um, so, um, in the winter of 1961-62, a group of about 25 Nantucket women joined together to learn the art of cruel embroidery. They volunteered in order to embroider for the Jared Coffin House, both beginners and experts. The trust sponsored Erica Wilson, who has been called the Julia Child of Needlework, as you heard yesterday, to come to the island to teach them. And because of that, Erica Wilson became an island establishment. The masterpiece of the needlewomen's work was a suite of embroidered curtains, bedspread, and bed hangings they made for the largest of the guest rooms of the Jared Coffin House, designed by Erica Wilson. One curtain took five months to embroider with a cruel work border. Some of the same needlewomen also embroidered the bedspread for the Beinecke's master bedroom at 69 Main Street, which was restored and furnished at the same time as the Jared Coffin House, to be their winter home on the island, as both Walter and Marianne spent part of almost every week there. <clears throat> um, I've uh, sent this bedspread to the NHA to be donated, um, and uh, the uh, pattern was taken from the chintz curtains that you see hanging in the room. And I have the tracing paper pattern that was actually used, um, but it was too large a thing to bring with me on the boat. Um, and I also have some very large embroidery designs for huge, maybe for rugs or, or something that the needlewomen made um, that were also too large to uh, send here. But anyway, um, Somewhere in the NHA is the box that this bedspread came in a few weeks ago. Um, let's see. Oh, right. So after the Jared Coffin House opened as a year-round luxury hotel in 1963, the looms continued to develop into a world-famous hand-weaving enterprise, making custom textiles for both historic and modern interiors and they were marketed to the industry by Tybock Fabrics of New York, who had showrooms all over the country and even uh, internationally. 
The trust building on Main Street also became a showcase for many other island craftspeople. Gwen Geyer's knits, Pat Gardner's carved birds, lightship baskets, scrimshaw, whirly gigs, and macrame. The cloth company of Nantucket was created in 1965 when fabric designer Leslie Tillett, or Doris and Leslie Tillett, joined Nantucket Looms and the Needlewomen with silkscreen <coughs> printed fabrics, um, joining them to Nantucket's woven and embroidered textiles that had already existed. In 1968, unfortunately, the cloth company was disbanded. Um, and since Nantucket Looms was by then a profitable business, the trust sold it to managers Andy Oates and Bill Euler, who continued it successfully for many years, as you know. And here we can see my mother and my aunt and nephew, uh, our cousin, and my little brother, Walter Beinecke III, um, outside the Nantucket Looms building, now officially the Nantucket Looms building, no longer the Nash Nantucket Historical Trust building in 1968. Uh, <laughs> Needlery education also advanced on island with many trust-sponsored needlework experts that Marianne brought to the island from all over the United States, Sweden, Britain, and elsewhere. And many of the Nantucket Needlewomen won awards and became professional teachers. The Nantucket Needlewomen occupied a space in the Nantucket Historical Trust Building, or the Looms Building, as it was later known. They began as volunteers, but 11 women organized and discovered that what they were doing for fun could become a business. With the trust's help through my mother, in 1964, they studied embroidery with Miss Elizabeth Ranzjo of Sweden. And next, in 1965, Emily Louise Rivette, one of Britain's foremost authorities and teachers of all embroidery techniques, but particularly silk and ecclesiastical embroidery, was a visiting instructor for the summer, teaching five-week periods of daily classes for 40 off-island paying students, while 54 Nantucket women attended once a week for free, sponsored by the Trust. The classes took place in the breakfast room of the Hadwin Sattler House, which you may recognize here. The unfinished result of Marianne Beinecke's attendance in the class is now in the NHA collection, it was the artifact of the week a few uh, weeks ago on the NHA's online new, uh, newsletter. Um, Ms. Rivette was brought to America two more summers to teach classes for the Trust in 1967 and 1969. In November 1965, the Nantucket Needlewomen convened together to discuss future educational and teaching programs and business matters pertaining to the growth and objectives of the organization. At the meeting, Mildred Davis of Chestnut Hill, Massachusetts, an authority on American cruel embroidery, was a special guest to offer advice and her experience as a teacher and lecturer. In December of 1965, Mrs. Davis began teaching an intensive teacher training course in cruel embroidery coming to the island every other week. Some of those needlewomen attended the third annual Art of the Magic Needle exhibit in New Hope, Pennsylvania, that spring of 1966. I see Elizabeth is nodding her head. <laughs> where several of them won honors. The panel of judges was headed by Georgiana Brown Harbison, another new friend and advisor for the needlewomen. A graduation dinner and ceremony was held in June 1966 on Nantucket for the 36 needlewomen who took Mrs. Davis's course. 21 members received diplomas for completing the course in cruel embroidery, while 15 more members also received diplomas 
qualifying them to become teachers of embroidery. Marianne and the Needlewomen founded the Nantucket School of Needlery in 1966, under the auspices still of the Nantucket Historical Trust, with headquarters first in Harbor Square on Strait Wharf, in two buildings behind the bandstand. One building was for the needlery, where embroidery supplies were sold. The other was for the School of Needlery. <clears throat> By the way, in 1966 and 1967, the rearranging and development of Strait Wharf had just been partly finished, and that of South and Swains Wharves and the Boat Basin were beginning. A huge project of Walter's company, Sherburn Associates. It was a time of protests and ban the bee and no man is an island buttons. I even had one. Um, because people were very upset at the way he aggressively rearranged the derelict waterfront and made it the front door of the town. Um, I can very much sympathize with that. It must have been a huge shock to a lot of people, but it, it, it made the waterfront be welcoming to visitors and um, more upscale um, residents and visitors and um, basically began the transformation of Nantucket for better or worse into what it is today. Okay, now this is one of my favorite artifacts of all that were in the um, collection that I donated to the NHA. A long photograph glued on the back piece of a uh, back side of a piece of wood that my mother used as a cutting mat shows what I think is the whole population of the cloth company of Nantucket with weavers, embroiderers, and silk screeners gathered in the Harbor Square building, perhaps in 1966, commemorating a start or um, <coughs> an ending? I don't know. Um, I can recognize some of the faces, but I'm not sure who all of them are. Um, and I invite everybody to examine this either now or later in the collection um, to try and identify who everyone is. I know some of them. I'm sure some of you uh, know others of them and maybe some of you are even in this picture. So um, it would be wonderful if we knew who every single person was and what uh, relationship they had with the Nantucket Looms or the Needlewomen or uh, other parts of the cloth company. Um, at the back of this group, you can see, um, I can't really see, but, um, there's and, uh, Bill on the left, and Andy is at the back, and there's Doris and Leslie Tillett in the group, and my mother is on the right somewhere, but I can't see because there's sunshine. Um, but anyway, it's a, it's a wonderful group photograph, and I think very precious. My mother thought so also, because I found this photograph in the bottom drawer of her bedroom <coughs> desk which is where she kept very precious things like her children's valentines or school reports and other precious memories. So, um, <clears throat> so Marianne engaged leading authorities from all over the world to be resident on the island and in the summertime to conduct workshops managed by the needlewomen and to have classes for them as well. These classes by the Nantucket Needlewomen started in the summer of 1966, supplemented by lectures, exhibits, and seminars by off-island authorities like Mildred Davis, needlepoint expert Hope Hanley, and Georgiana Brown Harbison. Erica Wilson gave private lessons arranged through the needlery in the summer also. The summer of 1967 also had a full schedule of classes and special events by the needlewomen and international experts at the needlery, 
including Jacqueline Antoven from Seattle and Miss Rivette making her second visit. Um, Marianne and the School of Needlery also produced a booklet of stitches, 73 effective needlery stitches, which could be put in kits or sold as a souvenir. When the cloth company was broken up in the spring of 1968, I think because it was an economic drain on the historical trust, the looms was sold to Andy Oates and Bill Euler, as I mentioned. The tillets went on to other projects the needlery became a commercial needle workshop on South Water Street, but the Nantucket School of Needlery continued under the aegis of the trust, now in a newly restored building at 2 India Street, opposite the Garden of the Athenaeum. The Nantucket School of Needlery is the only one of its kind in the nation attempted to fill a void in the quality education of people in the art of needlework. After having a national survey made to confirm the need, Mary Ann Beinecke and the teachers developed the home study course to enable people to learn the various stitches of embroidery at their own pace, whether for amusement or to become a professional, whether on Nantucket or anywhere in the world. What do you do if you can't get to a school? The school must come to you, Marianne said. Marianne wrote the course in sections, starting with basic sti basics of stitches and designs and moving to more expert techniques. Um, so uh, here is, a, is an example of some of the pieces of actual embroidery that the teachers of the needle, School of Needlery would uh, produce as examples of the steps of a stitch. And then this shows the photograph and printed, that was printed uh, to have in the binder of, as part of the course of those same fabrics. They did a lot of experimentation with various fabrics, various yarns, various colors of yarns to see which ones would photograph the best in black and white. You know, at that time, color photography was too expensive to be able to afford. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so the teachers, as I said, carefully created hundreds of actual embroideries from a uniform fabric and yarns showing the steps in a stitch that were then photographed by Bill Haddon, printed and all enclosed in carefully designed red binders and linen covered clamshell boxes. Mona, one of my Marianne's pleasures in life was designing and having produced packaging for her courses, her yarns and prod other products. She loved the whole, the whole aspect of, of merchandising things to the best effect. Um, the home study course kits included all the materials needed for each section, such as cloth, yarn, needles, graph paper, or color cards. Students made samplers according to directions in the home study course and mailed them to the school. Their certified teachers studied the work, wrote critiques, and returned the sample and the evaluation to the student. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah. As the sections were produced, one to five, then six to 10, 11 to 15, and 16 to 20, the first students tried them out, gave feedback, and anxiously waited for the next installment like 19th century serial readers of Dickens' old curiosity shop. <laughs> In the NHA collection are various versions of the sections edited with notes of changes in Marianne's handwriting to be made to them before the next printing. Um, this shows a um, manila envelope with my mother's 
uh, instructions to Bill Haddon, the photographer, as to ch some other changes to um, the photographs that he might make to show the samples better. And at the top is a doodle cloth, as they call it, um, of uh, some needlepoint where there are various stitches tried out on it um, to be used either in the home study course or in a book that I'll tell you about that my mother later produced. And at the bottom is my mother's favorite ski hat, which, has, which was knitted and then embroidered by Gwen Guyard um, for her. To be qualified as a teacher of the school, a student must have attended the school for three years or completed the home study course, taken a final examination at the school, and practice taught under the supervision of one of the school's experienced teachers. Only after completion of these three facets of the program was a student awarded a diploma certified by the Education Department of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So this was, this was part of the vocational uh, school uh, department of the state. So um, uh, this was serious business, but only if you wanted to become a certified professional teacher. Um, you didn't have to. You could take as many of, as much of the course as you wanted to and at your leisure. Summer courses also continued as before, with visiting experts such as acclaimed macrame artist Virginia Harvey and Margareta Grandin of Sweden, um, but also the needlewomen taught courses based on the home study course syllabus. <clears throat> Massive publicity coincided with the introduction of the home study course and the School of Needlery to the nation. A large clipping binder um, that I donated as part of the archive has 77 articles published in newspapers all over the country from a single AP News Features writer's story that was made about the uh, founding of and, and production of the home study course in the school. Um, this just shows part of one page spread of, of that binder of clippings. And it's interesting to read them and compare them and try and figure out what the original story might have held. And each newspaper modified it in a different way to make it their own story, you know. Um, to India Street was a spacious headquarters for the school. In what looks like a typical Nantucket 19th century house, there were rooms for multiple workshops and seminars and offices and supplies of yarns, notions, and fabrics. And here you can see my mother um, working on uh, some project with the uh, yarns uh, on shelves behind her that were available for students and teachers to make use of as they needed. In the course of researching among her books and writing the home study course, Marianne came to realize that many stitches were related to each other, representing families of stitches that can be used in many different ways. This inspired her to create a book on needlepoint or canvas work, what she preferred to call mesh work, that was published by Dover in 1973 as basic needlery stitches on mesh fabric, and which you can see here. In the book, she shows that needle pointers don't have to stick to the one or two same boring stitches for their whole piece, but can use a large palette of stitches from other disciplines of embroidery for increased interest and texture. And here you see my prejudice against needlepoint coming out. Um, but my mother was always very fond of, of this technique of embroidery. <clears throat> uh, needlepoint was the first project of embroidery that my mother ever taught me to do, and I never did finish it uh, <laughs> back when I was eight years old. Um, in the NHA collection I donated are many pieces of meshwork stitched in hot pink yarn 
that are her exercises or doodles for figuring out the stitches in her book. And then you can see one of them at the right side. Um, Marianne deposited her extensive library of more than 1,200 rare and useful books on all aspects of textiles and design in the library of the School of Needlery. Eventually, she gave it to the Clark Art Institute in Williamstown, Massachusetts, where it is still available as the Marianne Beinecke Decorative Art Collection. Um, just an aside, Walter Beinecke was also a collector of rare books, and uh, as was his father and his uncles. They founded the Beinecke Rare Book Library at Yale. And um, so when my mother married him, she, of course, got into the fun of collecting books on her particular specialties, which grew to become this large library of a lot of very special and rare and unique uh, books. When Miss Rivette returned to continue teaching ecclesiastic embroidery, she brought with her a rare example of 17th century stump work to show to the teachers and supervised the teachers in creating a similar elaborate masterpiece of silk and metallic threads. The completed piece can be seen in this photo of the library at the school over the mantel. And I'm sorry that it's uh, you know, so dim, but the only color photo of the piece was taken 45 years later after it had been in a very disreputable barn storage area <laughs> and when it was much stained and not in very good shape, uh, but which you can see here and it's still magnificent. So each teacher did a part of it and then they all put it together with uh, silk embroidery and metallic embroidery and uh, stump work is a three-dimensional form of embroidery. It has parts to it that have been padded and raised and, and covered with silk and metallics uh, to, to make a very uh, magnificent uh, presentation. And it's most often used, I think, in various ecclesiastical type uh, situations. Uh, by the way, I don't know where this is now. Um, it was sold during the estate auction of my mother, and I don't know who bought it. You know, so where it exists now, I don't know. Maybe the NHA bought it. I, I don't know. Uh -huh. But um, anyway, we at least have this snapshot that I took of it. Marianne Beinecke and her associates developed a custom line of embroidery yarn called Nantucket Twist, the forerunner of her later yarns 88 line, Dimmin, and Epic 99 line, and she researched the location of other hard to find needlework supplies. Metallics for ecclesiastic work, like gold or silver bullion, or this cloth of gold, uh, were especially scarce. And so at the School of Needlery, they had a supply of these things that they were able to. Uh, sell to people who needed them. And I incorporated some non-traditionally into this tapestry that I made after taking one of the school's summer courses in 1970. And um, in a few places, there are glimmers of metallics incorporated with the other yarns uh, to show the moonlight you know, shining off of them and on the unicorn's horns. Um, Henry Willett of Willett Stained Glass Studios taught courses in um, uh, symbols and uh, other ecclesiastic um, knowledge that is important to know when you're designing for churches or synagogues. Um, he, was, he and his family were longtime summer residents of Nantucket also. <clears throat> uh, many experts on embroidery continued to teach or lecture at the school. Margareta Grandin, 
uh, later Grandine Nettles of Sweden became a resident teacher. In 1969, the Beinecke family moved to Williamstown, Massachusetts, my family, while I was at college, as their winter residence instead of New York City. And Marianne became very involved in historic preservation and rehabilitation of old mills in the nearby city of North Adams, as well as other areas of Massachusetts and New England. And she worked with Governor Dukakis on several of his committees, like the Designer Selection Board and, and uh, other, um, and with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Um, Meanwhile, Walter and the Nantucket Historic Trust had moved on to supporting other projects, such as the Preservation Institute in Nantucket, in collaboration with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And I was away studying bookbinding from 1972 to 1975, so I wasn't on island, and I don't have inside knowledge of how the School of Needlery came to no longer exist on the island. According to papers in her files, in the spring of 1975, Marianne established Textile Studios, a company in the Windsor Mill in North Adams, with Margareta Grandine Nettles as the president. That summer, the assets of the Nantucket School of Needlery were transferred to Textile Studios. Fortunately, for a while, the trust continued to support the supervision of the home study course by textile studios. By the time I returned to Nantucket in the fall of 1975 to set up my bindery and to live here year-round, the Nantucket School of Neederly was no longer here. I hope that the teachers and students of the school continued their careers in some way but that is for others to fill in the history. And I hope you all will contribute what you know um, to, to let the story be complete or more complete as it could be. So thank you very much and I welcome any questions. <laughs>